To say that the Bible is all about Jesus Christ might sound a bit far-fetched. Clearly, many of the Jews did not believe Jesus is in their Bible, our Old Testament. Others might argue Jesus of Nazareth doesn't even enter the Bible until you're more than two-thirds of the way through and starting into the New Testament. But the Apostle and Evangelist John closes his gospel with these intriguing words. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. The four Gospels are merely digests of Jesus' words and works. A more comprehensive writing would dwarf even the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus also said something important to his disciples when he appeared among them in the upper room the night after he rose from the dead. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms is the way Jesus referred to their scriptures in Jesus' day, what we call the Old Testament. So what was written about Jesus in the books of the Old Testament? In the rest of this session and the next three, we are going to work our way through those 39 books looking for the things written about Jesus there. We'll start with the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. To the Jew of Jesus' day and before, these five books of Moses were the most important part of the Old Testament. The book of Genesis gets its name from the Greek title for this book, which means birth or genealogy. In Genesis, Moses sets out a series of births or beginnings from creation itself to the start of sin, to humanity's restart after Noah's flood, to the beginning of a chosen nation. Let's start with creation. Genesis begins with the famous words, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. If you look closely, you'll notice the first and third persons of the Trinity in this account. God the Father created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. But where is the second person, the Son of God? In two places, St. Paul wrote about Jesus' role in creation. Yet for us there is one God the Father, from whom are all things and of whom we exist, and the Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. For by him, the Son of God, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So everything is made through the Son of God and for him. So where is the Son of God in the creation account in Genesis 1? The Apostle John gives us a clue in the first verses of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John mirrors the opening language of Genesis 1 to identify the Son of God as the Word. That goes right to Genesis 1 and the means through which God created everything. Over and over we read, And God said, Isn't that reminiscent of Jesus' public ministry in the Gospels? Over and over he simply speaks and a divine miracle occurs, whether healing the sick, driving out demons, stilling storms, or raising the dead. So right away in Genesis 1, the Son of God is right there, front and center, speaking the heavens and earth into existence and bringing form to every single thing by the power of his word. Where do we find him next in Genesis? In chapter 3, Moses describes the genesis of sin and how the serpent's cunning temptation enticed Adam and Eve's eating of the forbidden fruit, which shattered God's perfect world. Afterward, God met Adam, Eve, and the serpent in the garden. Turning to the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There, in a nutshell, is the entire gospel. The Son of God will become a human, enter his creation, and undo the damage which Satan had done through the first man and woman. A new history of mankind 
fallen mankind began. Adam and Eve were driven away from the beautiful Garden of Eden and learned the toilsome work of farming the ground to grow food for themselves and their family. They conceived a child and named him Cain. Eve became pregnant again and gave birth to Abel. These two sons set the stage for the relationship which would exist between believers and unbelievers throughout human history. When the boys grew up, both Cain and Abel brought sacrifices to God. Abel's sacrifice was accepted because his sacrifice was given in thanks for God's promise, which he trusted. Cain's sacrifice was rejected because he didn't believe. Cain became furious, not at himself for offering an unacceptable sacrifice, but at Abel for upstaging him and at God for rejecting him, even though God told him he would be accepted if he repented and did what was right. But Cain didn't listen to God. He struck Abel dead. Cain turned his back to live without God and raised his family as unbelievers. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters, including a son named Seth, who took up the staff of faith that fell from Abel's dying hands. Genesis 5 chronicles the believing line that descended from Seth. It begins with Adam and ends with Noah. But in those intervening years, the unbelieving children of Cain grew numerous and spread their unbelief into the believing line of Seth especially when their children intermarried. By the time Noah came along, God was grieved by the cruelty and coldness Satan unleashed within the human family. The Lord was determined to blot out mankind by a flood. Our very existence was in jeopardy, as was God's plan to save the world through his son. But one man of Seth's family found favor in God's eyes. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Noah still believed the promise. So God instructed him how to build an ocean-going vessel, the ark, to save a remnant of humanity and representatives of all the land animals. The floodwaters lifted his ark to safety while the unbelievers in the ancient world perished around him. By God's grace, Noah and his family left the ark, and his three sons and their three wives began replenishing the human population. But the same pattern began to develop in the descendants of Noah, just as it had in those of Adam. As the population of the human family increased and began to fill the earth, people were more and more concerned with their own dreams, goals, and ambitions than with God's promise to save them. So God chose a man whose offspring would form a special nation, which he would separate from the influence of the surrounding nations. He would give them his special revelations and, in time, bring forth the Savior of the world from them. He chose Abraham and his wife Sarah. He told Abraham to leave his fatherland and all its influences and go to a place God will reveal along the way, a land his heirs will inherit. He promised to make his descendants into a great nation, give them the land in which he will dwell as a stranger, and bless all nations through his offspring, that Savior promised to Adam and Eve. Though Abraham was 99 years old and his wife Sarah 89 and unable to have children, God gave her power to conceive and give birth to a son, Isaac, in her old age. Isaac grew up and married Rebekah, the granddaughter of Abraham's brother, and God repeated his messianic promise to bless all nations through Isaac's offspring. Isaac and Rebekah gave birth to twins, Esau and Jacob. God chose Jacob, renamed him Israel, and promised in a dream that all nations will be blessed through his offspring, the promised Savior, Jesus Christ. Jacob married the two daughters of Rebekah's brother Laban and fathered twelve sons through them and their maidservants. These twelve sons became the fathers of the twelve tribes of Israel. Genesis closes with Jacob's family moving to Egypt to survive a horrible famine. Exodus picks up where Genesis left off. Jacob's descendants remain in Egypt where they grow and multiply until the Egyptians come to fear and dread them and reduce them to slavery. Four hundred some years go by, and Israel cries out to God for deliverance. God raises up a member of the tribe of Levi to deliver them. This deliverer is born under an edict which Pharaoh enacts in an effort to weaken the power of his Israelite slaves and prevent them from rebelling against him at that time or in the future. He commands all male Hebrew babies to be thrown into the Nile River. Moses' mother places her baby in a basket, which has been coated with pitch on the inside and outside to make it waterproof, then carefully placed in the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Pharaoh's own daughter spots and retrieves the basket and adopts Moses as her own child. 
After being nursed by his own mother until he is weaned, Moses is raised in Pharaoh's household. Moses doesn't tell us much about his Egyptian youth. We learn it oddly enough in the first sermon of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. He tells us, And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40, Moses killed an Egyptian to avenge an Israelite being wronged. Again, Stephen tells us Moses' motivation to do this. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. When word of Moses' deeds comes to Pharaoh, Moses has to flee for his life into the land of Midian. He lives in exile as a shepherd there for 40 years, shepherding the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro. The nation of Israel is in a position much like the whole human race. They are enslaved by a mighty foe and have no possibility to free themselves, just as we are held enslaved by Satan, sin, death, and hell. Despite his education and mighty deeds, Moses is powerless to set Israel free. They will remain slaves forever unless God steps forward and sets them free by his mighty hand. And that is exactly what God does. He appears to Moses on Mount Sinai in a burning bush. Moses sees the bush burning in the distance, but can't understand why it isn't burning up, so he goes over to investigate. God calls out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Two clues to who is speaking to Moses in the bush. First, angels cannot make the ground holy. Only God can do that. Secondly, he answers Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is none other than the Son of God, the Word as the Apostle and Evangelist John would say. When Moses asked God's name to convince the Jews that God had sent him, the Lord answered, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. It is no coincidence that during his earthly life, Jesus picked up this rather elusive, mysterious name, I am, and filled it out. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. Appearing before Pharaoh, a proud and stubborn ruler, God works ten mighty plagues through Moses, which finally compels Pharaoh to drive the Israelites out of his land. The tenth and final plague was Passover. At midnight, the angel of death passed through Egypt and killed all firstborn males. But God provided his people the Passover lamb. It was to be slaughtered and its blood painted onto the doorposts and lentil. When the angel of death saw a house marked with the blood of the Passover lamb, it passed over that house and spared the firstborn. Then the worshippers ate the Passover feast, the meat of which was the roasted Passover lamb. Each of these lambs symbolized the coming sacrifice, the perfect Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. At his last supper, when Jesus was celebrating Passover with his disciples, he instituted Holy Communion giving us his very own body to eat and blood to drink, the ultimate Passover lamb. Marked by his blood, the angel of death will pass over us on judgment day and spare us from eternal death in hell. When Pharaoh's firstborn died, he drove Israel out, but later changed his mind and pursued the fleeing Israelites to where they were encamped by the Red Sea. God parted the waters and the Israelites crossed through on dry land. When Pharaoh ordered his troops to pursue them into the sea, God brought the waters back over them, destroying one of the strongest armies on earth at the time. The rest of Exodus chronicles Israel's journey from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, where God establishes his covenant with Israel centered in his Ten Commandments. These commandments show God's standard for earning eternal life. We must be absolutely perfect as he is. It points ahead to the perfect Son of God, who will live a holy and blameless life on earth in our place. Since our sinful nature makes that kind of perfection unattainable for Israel and for us,
God established a sacrificial system whereby the sins of Israel could be transferred to a designated victim, which was put to death to pay for their sins and satisfy God's wrath. Like the Passover lamb, each of the sacrifices God prescribed for Israel revealed a different facet or dimension of the sacrifice Jesus, the Lamb of God, would offer for us in his death on the cross. On Mount Sinai, God also gave Moses the design for the tent of meeting, the place where his glory will dwell among his people, sacrifices will be offered, and worship will be conducted. The book of Exodus closes with the construction of the tent of meeting and its furnishings and the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle. Moses' third book, Leviticus, is named for the tribe of Levi to which he and his brother Aaron belonged. God chose Aaron, his sons, and his direct descendants to be the priests of Israel and the rest of Aaron's cousins, the Levites, to be their assistants. Aaron was named high priest. Leviticus instructed Aaron and his descendants on the rules governing the worship life of Israel, its sacrifices, festivals, and liturgical calendar. This information was given to Moses during the 40 days he was on Mount Sinai, receiving the two tablets on which God had written the Ten Commandments. One historical interlude is recorded in Leviticus, a tragedy that falls during the ordination week for Aaron and his four sons. His eldest two, Nadab and Abihu, disobey God's direct instructions when offering incense and are immediately consumed by fire. God shows that he is holy and we must not trifle with the means or gifts by which he makes us holy. A New Testament equivalent is Paul's warning about the wrong reception of Holy Communion in the church at Corinth. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged." Likewise, we must not trifle with God's grace in Christ Jesus, thinking that by our own merits or innovations, we can satisfy God apart from Jesus Christ. Leviticus can be a difficult book to read through, or should I say plow through, especially since the worship system of the Old Testament no longer is observed in the New Testament church. But two things can help you appreciate this book a little more. First, it falls in the middle at the very heart of the books of Moses, And that shows the importance of sacrifice and worship for the Old Testament people of God. Secondly, and more importantly, every sacrifice, festival, and ritual God established for his people in Leviticus pointed ahead to the sacrifice of our Savior Jesus Christ, which fulfilled God's righteous plan and won our complete and free forgiveness. Each kind of sacrifice we read about in Leviticus conveys one aspect of Jesus' sacrifice— And only when we put the Levitical sacrifices together, the peace offering, the burnt offering, the guilt offering, etc., do we see the full scope of forgiveness God offers us through the Lamb of God sacrificed for us on the cross. Numbers is Moses' fourth book. It's named for two numberings or censuses taken of the Israelites. The first occurs before they leave Mount Sinai. After giving Moses the two tablets with the Ten Commandments and the construction of the tabernacle, God organizes Israel into a mighty army which can break camp, move, and set camp back up with extreme efficiency. After the first census, God's pillar of cloud and fire leads them north from Mount Sinai, and they arrive at the southern border of the Promised Land barely a year after having left Egypt, ready to go in and receive the Promised Land from God's mighty hand but a series of rebellions breaks out, first begun by Moses' own sister Miriam and brother Aaron. Then ten spies who fear the nations living in Canaan give a bad report of the promised land. That causes the people to rebel against God, refusing his command to go up and take possession of the land. As punishment, the nation must wander through the wilderness 40 years until every warrior who is 20 years and older falls and the next generation arises to replace them. One final rebellion breaks out as the Levites turn against Aaron because they want the full priesthood. 
These disobedient rebellions contrast sharply with Jesus' life of complete obedience and humility, clear to the point of dying by crucifixion to make us clean. Forty years later, when that generation of rebels falls dead, a second census follows, showing God has faithfully preserved the nation in the wilderness for 40 years. As Numbers closes, Israel is camped out on the swollen banks of the Jordan River across from Jericho in the Promised Land. Moses' fifth and final book, Deuteronomy, is a series of farewell sermons. Moses preaches with a sense of urgency, knowing this is his last chance to reach Israel. Moses commands them to remember God's works in the past and commit themselves to God's gracious covenant in the future so they won't forsake the Lord their God when they settle in the promised land. The name Deuteronomy comes from the Greek translation of Moses' fifth book and means second law because Moses recites the Ten Commandments to the children of those who had been brought out of Egypt. One of the most significant parts of Deuteronomy is Moses' promise about a future prophet God will raise up for the Israelites. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Clearly, this messianic prophecy pointed straight to Jesus. Indeed, this book of Deuteronomy was precious to the Son of God, our Savior. In his temptation in the wilderness, Jesus drew his response to each of Satan's final three temptations from Deuteronomy. At the close of the book, Moses hands the reins over to Joshua, then climbs Mount Nebo, from which God shows him the promised land and where each tribe will live. Then Moses dies and God buries him. This ends the books of Moses, and indeed the people of Israel considered these five books the holiest part of their Old Testament Bible something like the way we honor the four Gospels of Jesus Christ over the remaining books of the New Testament. But Deuteronomy leaves the people of Israel with unfinished business. They still have to cross over the Jordan River to conquer the Promised Land. In our next session, we will recap the remaining history books and look for Jesus in them. <music>